Hey everyone, today I'm just going to do a really small two-part tutorial on taking a finished sequence from Avid Media Composer and bringing it back into DaVinci Resolve uh, for color correction and eventual output. This is something that a bunch of people in the comments have asked for, so I thought I would just take a really simple sequence and show you the basics of how to do it. So this is going to be a two-part video series. This is part one, best practices for locking a cut in Avid Media Composer. And part two will be relinking the Avid sequence in Resolve via an AAF. So let's get started. I have a project uh, here in Avid Media Composer. This is a project, a demo project that I created with some footage. As you can see here, I have a sequence. It's not very long, but I think for the purposes of this demo, it'll be fine. It has a few clips in it. So I processed all of these dailies originally using DaVinci Resolve. Um, with a tried and true method that I always like to follow in terms of how to process those dailies at the beginning of a project. If you haven't done that before or if you want to know more about it, I have a longer video series on processing dailies in DaVinci Resolve for Avid Media Composer. I really recommend that you have a look at that series and I'll link it down below just because it takes you through all of the really, really key steps to maintaining your link and your metadata from one video uh, editing software to the other so that you can make sure that everything will relink at the end of the project. So as you can see, we have all this different footage here. It's just a few different clips of some interesting B-roll footage that I had. And um, in my sequence here, I've got, in this case, I've only got like one simple audio track and one simple video track, although you'll probably have in your sequences stuff that's a lot more complicated. That being said, I think the process that I'm about to follow is a good guideline for how to approach your sequence locking. So, okay, so I've just got this sequence and let's say the director just left and the producers just left and they're like, yep, this is exactly what we want. This is our sequence. So we can look at this and we can see all the clips are there, but there's a few things that are missing um, in terms of getting the show locked, getting it organized, getting it ready for output. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a look over it. In this case, I've got everything on V1, but in your case, you might, for example, have like a really complicated sequence that has like stuff on all these different tracks. And the first step that I always follow is I try to simplify the video tracks as much as possible. So in this case, I'm just gonna make sure that everything is down on one track. So basically I've got the start of my video. Um, in this case, cause I was messing around with the sequence and I was working really quickly. Um, you can see that the start time of my video is actually at time code 5925 in my sequence, which is not particularly useful and is not good practice for locking a cut. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna set a, a unified start time for my sequence. That might be the one hour, it might be 10 hours, depending on what you prefer. In this case, I want my sequence to start want all my video clips to start at the one hour mark. So there's a few different ways that I could do this. I could like try to move all my clips down the timeline, but that risks like causing a lot of problems and possibly I could mess up my timeline. So I'm actually just gonna change the start time of my sequence. So in Avid, I take my sequence here in my sequence bin, which is my final sequence. I'm just gonna right click and click sequence report. Um, and then right at the top here is where you can choose the starting time code of your sequence. And you can change this anytime you want. So I'm gonna change it to one hour. And then I'm gonna click apply changes. Um, the rest of the stuff down below is for generating sequence reports, which we're not gonna use. So I'm actually gonna click cancel, but because I've already applied the changes, as you can see, now my sequence starts at the one hour mark uh, instead of the weird time code that it started at before. So that's good practice number one. The next thing I want to do is I probably want to add like a slate and a two beep at the start of my sequence so that I have a really, really clear um, setup for when I'm sending stuff to an audio mix maybe and also for when I'm lining things up even in Resolve to do my color correct. I can make sure that I have like a proper reference. So adding a, a visual and an audio to be is really, really important and also putting a slate to say like what is this project and what is this video that I'm about to see. So I'm gonna obviously wanna put that in front like even earlier than this one hour time code. So I need to add some more black space at the front of the sequence to accommodate that. So I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna click timeline, add filler at start. And it's just gonna give me a whole bunch of filler at the beginning. So now actually my sequence time code starts at 5930. It's given me 30 seconds of black at the beginning of the sequence, which is more than enough for my purposes. So that's gonna be fine. So now what I wanna do is I wanna create a two beep, which includes usually like a visual cue. So some kind of video bit, whether it's just like, a, you can use a, 
a title that has like the number two on it. You can use a white flash. You can use bars. There's a variety of things that you can use um, depending on what you have. But Avid makes it really, really easy to create a visual beep because it actually comes pre-installed with a bunch of different uh, bars and calibration tools. So all I have to do is import a still image that is what I want to use. So I'm going to, in my bin here, I'm going to click import and I'm going to import the media. And anyone who's installed Avid Media Composer, if you've installed the supporting files, which is part of the basic install of Avid, you will have this. So I'm going to go into my applications folder. I'm going to navigate to my Avid Media Composer folder. Um, and then I'm going to go into this supporting files folder. And then there's a folder at the bottom called test patterns. And here there's a whole bunch of test patterns that Avid just gives you that you can use. Um, so I'm going to use my Simpty bars. Now, one thing that you have to remember when you're bringing in your Simpty bars is that you actually probably want to, as a good practice, make sure that they're actually Simpty color levels, because if you bring in your bars at like a weird color calibration, then they're not going to function very well as bars. So under the options, I'm just going to make sure that the image settings are correct. So image size for current format is fine because then it will fill the screen. Under color levels, you want to make sure that you it's treated as legal range. So if you click scale from full range to legal range, you're going to modify the color values of this image, which you don't want to do. So make sure that it's clicked do not modify. And then you, there's no alpha channel. Um, and so you can just leave that as ignore and then click OK. And then import your SMPTE bars. So here we go, here are my SMPTE bars. So all I need for my two beep is a single frame. So I'm gonna just grab a frame and I'm gonna navigate on my timeline to 005958, right there. And I'm gonna mark an in and out, just like one frame there. And I'm just gonna put that right there. Um, and so now I have a visual cue and now I just need an audio cue for my audio two beep. So you can, Again, you can create that in Avid. You don't need to actually even import anything. You can create it using the audio tool. So tools, audio tool, and here's our audio tool. And under this menu on here, you can click create tone media. Um, and that will just create uh, a negative 20, like a tone uh, file for you. And you can do it for as many tracks as you want. So you can have a look at your sequence and determine how many tracks you have. In this case, I have Two, I actually have, I have technically two tracks in my sequence, but I only actually have one track of audio. So I'm just gonna create like a one track tone. Um, so there's my tone, I'm gonna create one track. It asks me what bin I wanna put it in and what my target drive for the media is gonna be. And I'm just gonna click okay. So it's created this tone clip for me and here it is in my bin. So now I'm just gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna take this tone clip. I'm gonna grab one frame of it. I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna put it onto a one there. So now we have video and audio. Boop, there's my tone. That was my voice, not the tone. So that tone is sitting at 59.58. My picture start is at one hour, that's all good. Now the last thing I wanna do is I probably wanna create a slate for this little sequence. So I'm gonna open up my title tool. Now, some people like to use marquee tool in Avid. Some people use external titling. You can do whatever you want. I just still really like Avid's like really simple title tool. Um, and so I'm just, cause I'm just gonna put some basic text in. Great, so now I've got a slate, I've got a two beep. Um, the last thing that I want that's going to be really important for providing this as a reference video to other departments for color correction for sound is having a timecode burn-in. So in your effects palette, you can go to generator and click timecode burn-in and just drag it over top onto an empty track in your sequence. And by default, it just gives you the little de sequence time down at the bottom, but you can make changes in the effects window. Um, so maybe under the appearance, maybe I wanna like make it a little bit bigger so people can see it. I, I sort of like to put, I like to put my time code at the top, unless somebody, one of the departments specifies that it has to go in a certain part of the screen. I like to put it at the top because sometimes at the bottom of the screen, I have slugs for like, this is gonna be a VFX shot or some sort of description of something, you know, ADR that's gonna happen. So I like to reserve the bottom of the frame for those types of notes and the top of the frame for time code, but you can do it however you want. Um, 
So we have the sequence time code up there. You can also ask, which I really like to do, I like to also ask it to display um, the sequence name because often my sequence will, in this case, I've just called it sequence final, but often the sequence um, will also be dated. And actually we can do that. I can, rather than just calling it sequence final, I can put an underscore and then put today's date as well. And that's always a good practice. And once I save that, it should show up. There we go. Um, and then, you know, I, I kind of make it the same size. So as the other one, and I'll just kind of mess around with the size and the position. So put that up there. And then um, any other information that you want to put on, there's up to four display boxes in the time code uh, window effect. And you can also put like custom text if you want um, and, and put that anywhere on the screen you want. So it's really handy. If you end up needing more than four or five lines of display, you can just put another time code effect on another track above and continue adding whatever kind of metadata time code or whatever information that you want to add for your sequence, depending on what the different departments are asking for. Um, but basic rule of thumb, sequence time code, sequence name, date, I think is always good practice. I don't think we need to do anything else. The only thing that I like to do just because I'm a little bit of a stickler for tidiness is I like to delete the tracks that I'm not using. So there's nothing on video two and there's nothing on audio two. So I'm just going to delete those tracks so that things are really tidy. So we don't accidentally end up with things on weird tracks that we're not expecting. Um, and that'll come into play and that'll be important later when we're doing delivery for a result. So I am going to export it and I'm going to use Avid's same as source uh, export, which I actually have a preset for, but I'll just show you what it looks like. So you're going to export as QuickTime Movie. I always like to use marks and selected tracks because as I make it a uh, kind of a habit to just select my in and outs and select all the tracks. Um, you might like to do it differently, but I don't see any point in exporting all this black at the top of the sequence. So I'm just going to start at the slate and do that. I'm going to obviously export both video and audio. I'm not going to do anything to the color levels and I'm going to leave the display aspect ratio at 16 by nine square pixel because this is an HD project. Um, and the audio format is just going to be stereo because this is just a reference. Um, I'm not creating a final deliverable. I'm, I don't need it to be five one or anything like that. So I'm just going to do a stereo output for this really simple reference and I'm going to click save and I'm going to navigate to the folder here and I'm going to click save. Okay, so that export is done and I have that QuickTime movie now sitting on my hard drive and here it is right here. Now in my next video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to export an AAF from Avid Media Composer so that we can actually take this sequence and bring it into Resolve, relink all of the clips from this sequence to the high res original media. So have a look at my next video for the next step.